Good morning, Forward. It is good to see you today. Let's pray as we get started. Father, I just come to you now and just acknowledge uh, how much I need your help uh, as we come into this message. Would you help us to set our minds on the Spirit? Would you help us, God, to set our hearts and minds on your words that are true? And would you change us by the power of your Spirit this morning? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Take your Bibles, open up to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, I want to welcome those of you who are new with us today or joining us online uh, that are new. Uh, My name's Kirk, I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Last week we started a brand new series uh, in uh, the book of Philippians chapter 4, talking about the idea of filtered. And we talked about the big idea that what you think about shapes the person you are becoming. The thoughts you have in your mind over and over again shape who you are becoming as a person. Not only today, but if you want to get an idea of the person you're going to be in the future, pay attention to what you're thinking about over and over again today because it's shaping who you are becoming. Your thoughts turn into your beliefs. Your beliefs turn into your feelings and your actions. There's brain science and the Word of God agree with each other that this is how we are wired as people. We talked about the idea that for every thought that you and I have, we have filters that we put those thoughts through. We have all kinds of different ways that we try and interpret the world through, a lens that we look at. The only question that we need to ask is, where are those thoughts and those filters leading us? Where are they ultimately taking us? And so we are being rooted in this five-week series in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Uh, Last week, if you were here, I challenged you to begin memorizing this passage of Scripture. Uh, I was going to, like, shame you all right now and say who started memorizing uh, the verse, but I won't do that this morning because we're talking about honor, and I don't want to shame you when we're talking about honor. Uh, But we are going to put uh, Philippians 4, verse 8 up on the screen. I want to ask us to read it together again as a church. If you've started memorizing it, You can close your eyes for a portion of this and just see how you do with uh, memorizing this passage. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 on the screen. Let's read it together. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. So last week, our first filter that we looked at was the truth filter. That every thought that we have needs to go through the filter of truth. And what was truth? We said truth is, first of all, the Word of God is true. From beginning to end, it is truth for our lives. It's God's Word to us. And so we need to put all of our thoughts through the filter of what God's word says. And we talked about how Jesus is the truth, that we need to put all of our thoughts through the lens of how Jesus lived truth, how he spoke truth, how he exhibited truth with his life. And so we have to have that filter of truth. And today, we're going to look at the word honorable. How do we put our thoughts through the filter of what is honorable? Now, in general, every person has three types of people in their life. These can be people you know and people you don't know. Three types of people that you have in your life. On on this side, you have people who you like. You get along with them. You have no problem honoring them because you like the way they think, you like the way they talk, you like the way that they relate to you, you like their beliefs, how they go about living their life. You just really appreciate them. You like them. And they sit in this chair and uh, you love them. Maybe that's even somebody in your family that you love. Uh, And so you have no problem honoring the people who sit in this chair in your life. Now on the other side of the coin, you have another type of person that's in your life. These are the people who annoy you. They frustrate you. They disappoint you. They hurt you. 
They do things that just make your mind spin, where you go, I cannot believe that they would do something like that. These are the people in your life that when you look at them, you just want to get angry. These are the people who when you think about them, you are not thinking happy thoughts. When you think about them, you are being typically very critical about them. Maybe it's someone you know. Maybe it's someone you don't know. Maybe it's a politician. Nobody's ever thought things like this about a politician. You've got these people who sit in this chair. Now let me ask you a question. When you think about people who, sat in, who sit in this chair in your life, over the past week, how much time and energy did you put into thinking about these people? How much energy did you put into thinking about how frustrated you get by this person? How annoyed you are by this person? How critical were your thoughts about this person who's sitting in this chair? Mark Twain once uh, famously said this. He said, nothing so needs reforming as other people's habits. <laughs> and that is where it is so easy for all of us to land, isn't it? The world would be so much a better place if everybody else just thought the way that I thought and went about living life the way that I go about living life. Now, there's a third type of person that you have in your life. And honestly, these are the people that you don't ever think about. They are in your world. You see them, but you never think about them. They could be people that you work with, that you pass down the hallway at work, but you don't really think about them. You just pass by them in the hallway. They could even be people that you go to church with that sit in front of you and sit behind you and you go through the rest of the week and you never, ever, ever think about them. You pass by them in the lobby after church and they never cross your mind. You just have no emotional attachment, no thoughts, negative, positive, one way or the other. You just live in this space where, yeah, I know there's other people in the world, but whatever. And you don't think at all about them. Now, if it's true that what you think about shapes who you are becoming as a person, then what type of person are your thoughts about other people leading you to become? Let me say that again. If what you think shapes, about, shapes who you're becoming, then what type of person are your thoughts about other people shaping you to become? See, when we talk about the idea of honor, honor is not dependent on what you feel about someone. I want to give you a picture of, of the scope of honor that God's word calls us to, how extensive God calls us towards honor in our lives. Uh, he calls us to something that most of us would already know, honor our parents. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2 says we are to honor our parents. This is not for children only. We all love to preach this message to our kids. You need to honor your parents. But this is not for kids only. There is no age limit on this. We are all called to honor our parents. The Bible teaches us to honor those who are older than us. It teaches us that we are to honor those who are in authority over us. We are to honor our government leaders. We are to honor the police. The Bible teaches us that we are to honor our elders, our pastors in our churches. In fact, it actually uses the word double honor for those who spend time in the Bible and preparing to teach the Bible. That there is to be an abundance of respect by the church to the elders of the church. The Bible teaches us that we are to honor our employers and our employees and our co-workers. It says you are to honor your spouse if you're married, and you are to honor marriage. And then it says in Romans chapter 12 that we are to honor each other. In fact, in Romans 12 it says we are to outdo one another in showing honor. That this is not just like a little baby step forward in honor, but this is to be like a way of life with each other. We outdo each other in showing honor to each other. Now, some of you right now, you're breathing a sigh of relief because the really annoying person hasn't shown up in your list yet. So just to cover that off, 
The Bible also says that you are to honor everyone. That there are no exceptions. You are to honor the frustrating and annoying person. You are to honor the person that you never pay any attention to. That there should not be three separate chairs in our life of three different types of people, but one chair, and it's the chair of honor for every person. That's the standard that the Bible teaches to us. There is nothing in the Bible where there is a little side note that says, well, if they've been good to you, then honor them. There are no conditions attached to honoring people in the Bible. We are the ones who end up creating the conditions. We are the ones who live in the space of saying, well, if they do this for me, I will honor them. If you were here with us last week, I talked about how I spoke, I, I talked about how we add additional filters on top of the filter of truth. This is one of those areas where we add those additional filters on top of the filter of truth. Because we don't like the idea of honoring certain types of people. So what do we mean? God calls us to honor. This is not about how you and I feel. So what do we mean by honor, though? Honor means this. Honor means that you are to value you are to show respect. And many times in the Bible, it also means that you are to seek to enhance the reputation of another person. Honor is something you do both with your words and with your actions. And this is what God calls you and I to think about. That which is honorable. To think about what's valuable and respectful about another person. Not what we want to criticize and tear down about the other person. Now, you can say you are honoring someone without actually honoring them. And if you want evidence of that, you just need to watch question period in Parliament. Because every day in Parliament, when there's question period, there's this false sense of honor that happens. Someone will stand up and they'll say, okay, we have a question for the honorable member of whatever riding. And then they spend the next however many seconds or minutes just tearing a strip off the other person. And you see this picture where we say we're honoring, but we're not. In 1967, Lester Pearson had been accused of selling out Canada uh, with the signing of an automobile agreement with the U.S., Several years before that, John Diefenbaker had to deal with what was called the Munsinger Affair. It was a sex scandal where Canada's associate minister of defense had an affair with a German immigrant. And while both sides were kind of battling it out, as you can imagine, as political leaders battling it out with each other, calling each other every name and putting each other down and attacking each other, during the midst of all of that going on, Lester Pearson introduced what is called the Order of Canada. It is the highest honor that a private citizen of Canada can receive. The medal, we're going to put a picture on the screen there, the medal has the Latin motto on it, and it means this in English. They desired a better country. It's actually taken uh, out of context, but it's taken from the Bible, from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 16, where it talks about they desire a better country. However, in the press release that announced the Order of Canada... There was only one problem. The press release did not say Hebrews 11, verse 16. The press release said Hebrews 12, verse 16. Here's what Hebrews 12, verse 16 says. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, <laughs> as Esau, who for one morsel sold his birthright. It was funny and ironic because in, in many ways it was like playing up what was happening in real life. One side's accusing the other of, of fornicating, the other side's accusing the other of, of being a betrayer of the country, of selling the country out. And so Canada began its efforts to honor its citizens by continuing to figure out ways to tear each other down. If there is one thing that politics has taught us is that simply saying I honor you does not mean you are honoring that person. 
Things like the Order of Canada, they are conditional honors. They are re they're rewards for your achievements. But God's call for us to honor is not like that. So if it's true that we need to think about something over and over again in order to become a certain type of person, what do we need to think about so that we become honorable people? I want to give you two principles today that you need to think about so that you can become an honorable person. Here's the first one. Thinking about honor begins with thinking about the type of person God calls you to be. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2. And I want to begin reading at verse 2. It says this. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. I'm just going to stop right there. You know, there's a question that a lot of us get asked in our lives, and we ask it of other people. And honestly, the question drives me crazy. And the question is this, what kind of person do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? What do you want to do with your life? And here's the reason why the question drives me crazy. Because it's such a low view of life to just ask the person what they want to be in life. It's such a low view of yourself to say, what kind of person do you want to be? See, the real question that we should be asking ourselves is, what kind of person does God want me to be? What kind of purpose does God want me to accomplish with my life? See, your creator has a much higher view and a much higher standard of the kind of person that you are called to be. He designed you that way. So we need to get away from asking ourselves the question, well, what do you want to be? That's the wrong question. The right question is, who does God want you to be? What type of person does he want you to become in life? So if you have a Bible in, in paper copy, I want you to look at verse 2. I want you to circle the word dignified in verse 2. Because the word dignified in verse 2 is the exact same word that's translated as honorable back in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. It's the exact same word. Thinking about what is honorable means that you need to think about what does it mean to be a respectable person in your own life first. That it starts with you. If you want to get a better idea of what this looks like, look at some of the other words that show up in this chapter. That you are to be self-controlled, sound in faith, and in love, and in steadfastness. That you're not to be a slanderer. All of these kinds of words... Give us a picture of what it means to be someone who is a respectable, honor-worthy type of person. If you want to get another picture of the type of person God's called you to be, look at the fruit of the Spirit. We said last week that the mind that is set on the Spirit is life and peace. That we're to give full control of our lives to the Holy Spirit, including our minds. And what's the evidence what is the evidence the Bible teaches us of a person who has surrendered themselves to the control of the Holy Spirit? The evidence is that you are a person of love. You're a person of joy, of peace, of gentleness, of goodness and faith and meekness and patience and self-control. That's the evidence of a person who has surrendered themselves to the Holy Spirit. Show me anywhere in there where it talks about being critical, being negative, putting down other people, dishonoring other people. God designed you to be this kind of person who is dignified. Someone who reflects his image in the world. 
who gives people a glimpse of what God himself is like. One of the things I joke about with my kids all the time is how I want to be the cranky old man who can just say anything. Like, I want to grow up, and I, when I get older, I want to be the guy who has, like, no filter, just says whatever is on his mind. There's only one problem with that. It's not what a godly man looks like. It's not what a godly person looks like. A godly person has to be dignified according to God's word and respectable themselves. It's not spirit-filled to be the cranky old man who just says whatever is on his mind. Your thoughts about the type of person that you want to be are going to lead you somewhere. Where are they leading you? You see, only people who are honorable and dignified people can truly be people who honor other people. It is impossible to be a spirit-filled, dignified, respectable person who is consistently being critical and tearing down other people. Those two worlds cannot coexist. Even if you have to speak the truth to someone, you still look at it through the lens of how am I going to do this in love? That's the first principle. Thinking about honor begins with thinking about the type of person God calls you to be. Here's the second principle. Honor requires you to think about people from God's perspective. Honor requires you to think about people from God's perspective. I want you to think about the person who sits in this chair. This one's really hard because for a lot of us, the person who sits in the chair, that we can't respect them, we can't honor them. Part of the reason you can't honor them is because they've done things to hurt you. They've sinned against you. And so when you think about this person, your emotions rise up. Your heart starts to beat a little bit faster. You tighten your, your fists a little bit more. And all that you can think about is how this person has sinned. And it's true. It's true. When you see people through God's eyes, you're going to see people who sin. The Bible says all of us have sinned. But that's also only half the story. Because when you see people through God's eyes, the story doesn't end with you see a sinner. You see a person who needs grace. You see a person who needs love. You see a person who needs forgiveness. Aren't you glad that God didn't leave you at the place of just looking at you as a sinner? Aren't you glad that God loved you so much he sent his son to take your place on the cross? That when he thinks about you, he doesn't just say that dirty, rotten sinner, but he says that's a person I love. And when you start to see the person sitting in this chair through the eyes of God, it will change the way you think about them. And when it changes the way you think about them, God's going to give you the grace and the strength to be able to honor this person. I promise you that. I promise you that. It doesn't happen at the snap of a finger. But I promise you that God will change your view of that person. And then there's the person who's sitting in this chair who is essentially a nobody to you. You never think about them. You go racing out a door, you don't even think about holding a door for them because you're just too busy running out to whatever task you have next. They're a nobody to you. I am so glad that we are children of a God who takes nobodies and makes them somebodies. I am so glad that we, we serve a God who comes down to this earth and when nobody wants anything to do with kids, says, let the kids come to me. I'm so glad that we serve a God that when everybody else is busy trying to clamor for his attention, that that nobody who is hurting and broken who, who is sick and wounded and dying, who just reaches out to grab just a touch of the garment of Jesus, 
There's nobody that Jesus turns and sees her. When we start to see people through the eyes of God, there are no such thing as nobodies because everybody is a somebody. God sees them through a different lens than what you and I see them. The Bible teaches us this in in Psalm chapter 8. We're going to put the verse up on the screen. It says this, What is man? What are humans that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made us a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You might be here wrestling with whether or not you can honor certain people in your life. But to overcome that, you need to understand that honoring people is ultimately about honoring God. Because it is God who created every person with honor and dignity and worth. It doesn't matter how different they are than you, how different they look than you. God has created every single human on this planet with honor and dignity and value. It is God who established authority figures in your life. It is God who created marriage. It's honoring to God to honor what God has created. Now, I've had all kinds of seasons in my life where I struggled with this idea. So I recognize that there might be some who are sitting here who go, I don't know if I can really bring myself to do this. Is this really a big deal, this idea of honor? And I want to say to you, yes, it is a huge deal. Here's why. Because honoring people directly impacts the health of your relationship with God. Turn over to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 7, likewise husbands, men who are married, pay attention right now. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. That's not talking about what you might think it's talking about. It's simply talking about physical realities that men typically are stronger than women physically, okay? Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Men who are married, there is every possibility that your prayers are going nowhere beyond the ceiling of your home because of the way that you treat your wife. The Bible is very clear. How you honor your wife is a direct connection to whether or not your prayers are making it to God. That word hindered actually means cut off. There's a direct connection to honor and your spiritual life. Now, for everybody else who's going, yeah, he should listen to this. Verse 8. All of you have unity of mind. Sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. There's the connection again. The further description that we just read about what it looks like to honor, and now it says, if you do this, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to your prayers. If you do this, if you live in an honoring way towards other people. Your willingness to honor other people, all people, is a direct connection and direct impact on your spiritual life. There is this connection between our vertical relationships with each other, or our horizontal relationship with each other, and our vertical relationship with God. There's a direct connection between those two. In 
In my own life, I've learned that I need to keep coming back to this over and over again. That I never totally kind of slam dunk this all the time and get it right. Because too often, I give in to my flesh and what I'm feeling in a moment. And I don't set my mind on what is right. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to ask everyone to close your eyes. And rather than just being a Sunday where we move on and go to the next song, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to give you a moment to reflect on what we're talking about here. Close your eyes, please. I want you to think about what is honorable. I want you to think about the people in your life right now who you find it easy to honor. And thank God for those people. I want you to think about the people that you have a hard time with. Or maybe it's the people you pass by every Sunday or at work or your neighbors during the week and you just simply ignore them. Now I want you to ask God to show you who have you been critical of and failed to think about in an honorable way. And as God brings those names to mind, I want you to ask God to forgive you. I want you to ask God to help you see that person from his perspective. Father, as we sit here in this moment, come and ask for your help. Not just for this moment, but for the minutes and the hours and the days that are ahead of us. Would you, God, by the power of your spirit, speak to us all throughout this week to help us revisit the idea of what it means to be honorable people. To help us think about what it means to do things with dignity. God, would you come and help us this week? Would you guard our hearts and our minds from the places where we want to live in condemnation of other people and help us to Help us to see what it looks like to honor. And then, God, would you give us the strength? Because sometimes it's going to take real strength to be able to step out with our words and our actions to live honorably to all as you've called us to. God, we need your help. I ask, God, that this is not just a week that is filled with information, but by the power of your spirit, you would transform us into a people who outdo one another in showing honor. I ask this in your mighty name. Amen. If you could all rise, we're just going to respond and pray.